Mabohai, and good morning. My name is Jürgen Steinmetz. I'm joining you from Itobo News and live stream for the breaking news show, this time from Manila, Philippines. With me is Dr. Peter Taller in College Station, Texas. It seems to be a beautiful day here in Manila. Um, I'm, I'm here at the Marriott Manila Hotel. I'm looking out actually to the airport and uh, it seems to be a very nice and calm day. I haven't been outside yet. How are things in College Station? Well, we had a, today, of course, it's evening now in College Station because you're a day ahead of us in the Philippines. But we had a very rainy day. And actually, most people are very happy about that because we've had um, almost no rain for well over a month. And we need the rain desperately. So today we had a really uh, hard rain that was soaking for about um, eight or nine hours. And all our plants are now very happy. Uh, the yellow grass is turning green. And um, we're, it, it got cool. So it was a cool, rainy day today. Tomorrow, the sun will be out. But uh, right now, everybody's lawn is turning green and everybody's flowers are telling them how happy they are. So we're, 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 we're glad to see the spring rains come. It, it, it's a good thing for us here. Um, but I'm sure that your experience in the Philippines has been very unique. We won't need to go into some of your personal experiences, but one of the things that the Philippines is really well known for is lovely people and very caring people. And so I was wondering if you could, you know, is that true? And are they hospitable to tourists in the Philippines? I, I would say more. I think the entire world can actually le uh, learn uh, from the Philippines when it comes to hospitality. And that's why the human factor, the Philippines that are working abroad uh, in literally any country in the world. I mean, you can go to the Middle East, like in the UAE, uh, even Saudi Arabia. Um, it's the hospitality industry is run by Filipinos. It's the same in countries even like the Seychelles. And, and of course, even where I live in Hawaii, there are many Philippines that maybe have an American passport, but they're, you know, have, they're Filipinos. Mm -hmm. And I have to say, if you experience this here in... Um, uh, in the Philippines, um, yes, uh, hospitality and service is, um, it's a big factor. And people go out of their way. They're, they're not going to tell you they cannot do this. They find a way to do this. They're creative. Yeah, that's really important because so much of the tourism industry has failed on customer <laughs> service. And you would kind of expect that to some extent, the Philippines' number one export has been nurses. The Philippines are known for sending nurses Absolutely. and caregivers around the world. I know when I'm in Israel, I get to see uh, lots of Filipino nurses and uh, or Filipino um, caregivers. And, you know, tourism has lacked that. Uh, you see that on airlines. Um, I've, I've been looking at all the various uh, analysis of the various air carriers, uh, both American and European and Asian. And one of the things complaints is constantly on long haul flights, the crew serves dinner, and then they disappear for eight hours, and then you don't see them again until breakfast. And they're not checking on you. They're not asking if you need anything. And um, I did see the review of Philippine Airlines. And one of the things that was constantly emphasized was the crew went out of its way to be caring towards its passengers. So um, I think that's really good. Uh, it, 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 tourism to work has to have good customer service, and it has to have caring people. And if the Philippines can be a symbol for much of the world on that, that's really a very helpful sign. Yeah, and the Philippines can, but I think what the Philippines is lacking to sell this domestically in the tourism sector. I think they can do a lot better in actually positioning its tourism industry. What's an excellent industry? The infrastructure is there for the most, most part. And this, as you said, the services here, I think it's lacking in my opinion, this is just for my taste, I think the food could be improved, for example. Um, but if you're not into Philippine food, I mean, here in Manila, you have plenty of other choices, of course. But when you get to the country, uh, then you're more stuck to uh, the traditional way. And honestly, it's I not my taste, like but maybe others like it. Yeah, it may be that the Philippine food is too healthy for you. Um, I, think, <laughs> I think you kind of like a lot of spices and um, salt. And I think you've had a kind of a salt-free diet. I personally like that. So I probably will love Philippine food at some point. Um, as long as I can avoid the pork issue, I'm in good, good to go. But I think that, um, you know what? I'm a firm believer 
even if you have an infrastructure problem or a food problem, if you have smiles and you have good customer service, that will compensate for almost any other problem that you have. No, and that's people, absolutely true, Peter. People will forgive an infrastructure problem. They'll forgive a bad meal, but they will not forgive bad customer service. And uh, that's really the essence, I think, of what makes um, not only the Philippines, but also other parts of Asia really um, go. Um, the sense of caring. Uh, Japan is, is incredibly good at customer service. Um, some of the South Asian uh, countries, uh, such as uh, Vietnam and uh, Cambodia, are well known for customer service. And I think the Philippines is a real symbol of the humanity of tourism. And if we talk about tourism as a means to bring people together, then the fine customer service, and it's not customer service, it's people caring about other people. And, and you have yeah. this, and you have this, of course, and as you said, in many other parts and um, in Asia, in Thailand, you know, the Thai smile is uh, uh, well worth it. Actually, I remember this flight I was on many years ago on Thai Airways from Bali to Bangkok, I think it was. And um, I've, I've been on that flight uh, on business uh, almost every week, so they kind of know me. And uh, when I asked, so what, what do you, what's the difference between you guys and Singapore Airlines? Because Singapore Airlines always had a superior uh, yeah. experience. Right. I said, well, I, I, we have to, I have to admit, you know, this came from one of the flight attendants. Um, they, they, they are, you know, they may have uh, better and even not, my nicer airplanes than us, but we have the nicer smile. So you can see smile really sells and yes, it, uh, friendliness sells. Yeah, a, a smile, a sense of caring, really sells. And in this world where there's so many problems, you have violence across much of Latin America. Certainly, you know, we don't know what will be in Europe. Um, the uh, foreign minister of Russia again say, said we may very well enter into World War III, but certainly um, we have a terrible crime wave in the United States. Um, when you have those types of issues, then what you're seeing is that when people care, that goes a long way. And so um, a smile can cover up many, many difficulties. Somebody asked me today, I run an organization and they said, why do you guys do so well on fundraising? And I said, because they know how to smile. And the person thought I was joking, but I wasn't. In other words, learning how to smile, learning how to listen, learning how to show caring are really essential qualities in the sense of, um, of making tourism work. And I think in that sense, the Philippines, I think could become a really major tourism center. Um, and it probably needs to have a little bit of work in some other areas, uh, maybe get a few major other international conventions and some uh, niche marketing. Um, and that may be really what they need. Uh, I'm working on something right now and you'll be, of course, will be helping us on um, in Panama. Uh, the idea of creating an international tourism, not just security conference, an international tourism well-being conference. And that will touch on everything from um, health to um, people feeling lonely when they're traveling to, um, of course, making sure that people don't get um, hurt uh, either physically or emotionally or economically when they travel. But again, those are the types of conferences I think that makes the world move. And no, absolutely. Tourism is about hospitality. It is about people and it is about peace. And uh, that's why the human interaction is such an important uh, factor in, in the human development. And it goes way beyond tourism. Uh, we yes. can see this in the times of wars and conflict, um, the human interaction between people um, may save this world, who knows, you know, and it, it's highly important. And tourism is playing an important role into this here in Manila. I think I can really say tourism can play an important role. Can not play an important, yes. Can play. And the reason for that is that there are places in the world where tourism is only interested, unfortunately, in getting your money. And there are other places in the world that tourism is really about interaction between human beings. If it's a former, then tourism really doesn't bring about peace. 
if it's the latter, then tourism does a wonderful job about uniting people. But in order to do that, we got to get out of the hotels. We got to get people to get to know each other, to talk to each other, share experiences, get to find ways to see each other. And those are all really basic qualities. And on some level, the tourism industry has been lacking. Um, think about how you're on a long haul flight and the flight attendants never want to talk to you. They're in the tourism business. You're in their home. I mean, it's a flying house, but it's still in the sky. Um, they should want to interact with as many uh, uh, as many uh, passengers as possible. Get to know them. What do you like? What don't you like? Um, I will say that today I wrote a letter to the main airline that I fly on, telling them that I hope that um, their premium flights, that the food improves. That the last time I was on it, it wasn't very good. And that I've gotten reports from other people that it was not very good. And they did write me back a letter and said, we want to thank you and we will work on that. So I don't know if they'll do anything or not, but the fact they at least recognized that I was writing to them and they didn't just blow me off, that's good. Uh, and, and, uh, and Peter, you and I were, uh, were young enough to remember the times of Pan American uh, when flying uh, was such a uh, privilege and the food was yes. so excellent. I remember the times where I was uh, privileged enough to fly first class on Pan American. I mean, you get the caviar, you get the Dom Perignon, you name it. No, it was all there. And and compare this today on, on my flight and uh, on, on my United Airlines flight in business class or Polaris, they call it, from Honolulu to Guam on my way to the Philippines. I couldn't eat the food. It was something I don't even know, some cabbage with some couscous, and it had no taste to it. it, it it's nothing. And it's all on one plate. You know, it's not served nicely like it was before. It's done without heart. And it's yes. and there's plenty of time. I mean, if eight hours on the flight, why not just bring the bring bring a salad? And then... Flight attendants can be bored. Exactly. Um, yeah, exactly. I, I remember, and I'm older than you are, but when in I, I flew and then first time in the 1960s, I was the first person in my family to fly. And I flew on Eastern Airlines, which doesn't exist anymore. It was a very short flight. It was from uh, Washington, D.C. to Newark. So it was about 45 minutes on the plane, which was considered really ecstatic. Nobody would get on the plane without a jacket and tie. Women wore heels and right. white gloves. That. And um, they actually served sandwiches between Washington and Newark. Today, right. you'd be lucky if you got a glass of water. Um, well, you have so, to be real lucky if you get this. You have to have a medical condition for that, I think. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, um, yeah, that's a real difference. And of course, you are right. Um, the first time I was on a long haul, a longer haul flight, which I think was um, Newark to uh, California, everything was served in bone china. Uh, with uh, and they came through with a cart with a carved roast beef. And right. I even just before COVID. If you remember, they served at least ice cream sundaes. They came around and, you know, what type would you like Sunday? Oh, now okay. you, get a Dixie, you get a Dixie cup if you're lucky. Yeah, no, I remember the time of ice cream Sunday on the Honolulu uh, to mainland flights. I had many times in, in uh, when you fly premium. And it went from uh, hagen dazs down to some secondary brand into some third type brand you couldn't even taste the ice cream anymore and then finally they got rid of the ice cream altogether so you, yes i know the, the times are changing yes i think maybe what they're trying to do is get us all to lose weight they figure the food is unedible it's another way to force us to lose weight but you know and forget about wine you know when, <laughs> when between um Guam and uh, Manila, and these are expensive flights. They're not like a first class ticket from uh, Guam to Manila. It's like $1,200 for a relatively short flight. And, and you asked for wine. I said, no, no, we don't serve wine. It's because of COVID. So that was a week ago. Yeah. So <laughs> I think we need to get rid of the, this concept. COVID has become the excuse for everything. Yes. And, and the public is going to get really disgusted with it. I think you know people are really tired of all the mandates would make no sense. So I can sit in a restaurant for three hours and I don't need a mask, but I get on a plane for an hour with a much better filtration system. And up until a few days ago, they would tell me I have a mask. And you say, why? They say, we don't know. And I cannot tell you how many times flight attendants said to me, 
make sure you wear as loose a mask as possible so you'll be comfortable. I'm thinking, if the mask is loose, that doesn't do any <laughs> good. <need> a mask. <laughs> so why do I need a mask? Well, it's really not for health. It's not for science. The mask is to show obedience to the government. Well, that's fascism. And we need to get beyond this. At this point, I think people are tired of it. People are really ready to um, go, uh, go beyond this. And uh, the bottom line is each time a virus um, mutates, it's weaker. Mo I think in the United States, I don't know around the world, but certainly in the United States, well over 90% of the population has either had vaccine or has had COVID or has some way has been exposed so that um, the chances now of, uh, you get breakthrough cases with uh, your vaccine. I just had the, my fourth shot uh, and I encourage people to be vaccinated, but it won't stop you from getting it. It'll just make it a lot more mild. Okay, but that's still, you know, good. And if we can come up with therapeutics, which should be easily available around the world, then COVID is no longer, it, it's a cold. That's what it is. You know, it, it's a coronavirus, but we need to have therapeutics. That's really the key. And tourism needs to be pushing for this type of stuff. And it needs to, and the international tourism and the post COVID needs a let's smile campaign where people are taught to smile around the world. Because if we can teach people to smile, we can bring this world back together. Now, Peter, I couldn't agree more with you. Maybe we should have a smile contest and yes. a smile award, you know? So. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe that would be something for the World Tourism Network. We have Absolutely. a hero award. We don't have, maybe we ought to have a smile award and people can send in their smiles and how they smile or something they've done nice to visitors in their country or nice for visitors in their country. And then we can, we, maybe we should give out twice a year an international smile award. Absolutely. Great idea. Let's look into this. All right. Well, well listen, please smile while you're in the Philippines. Enjoy all your time there. And um, I understand you're by a great shopping center. So go do a little bit of shopping and help the Philippine economy. Absolutely, Peter. Well, thank you very much, everyone, for watching us today on the Breaking News Show. Uh, we'll be back um, uh, soon, day or tomorrow. <clears throat> and if you wanted to watch any of our other shows, just go to breakingnewsshow.com, and you can find all our <clears throat> excuse me all our recent shows. Since Breaking News uh, is fairly new, you don't find all of our archives, what goes back now for several years. But simply click on the YouTube link, and you can go back as long as you want and see all our hundreds of events we had, and many also with Peter and myself. Well, Peter, you have a nice evening. Take hey, care, and, and uh, remember, talk to you soon. As you, it's daytime for you in the Philippines, so walk around and smile. <laughs> all right. My, My boy. Thank you.